Amen. Turn your Bibles over to the book of Micah. It's 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 one of the what's considered one of the minor prophets. You have Hosea, A Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah. We're going to start a new series today on the book of Micah. And We have 16 verses that we're going to cover, but we're, Michael 1 kind of sets up the stage of everything that we're going to discuss today. One of the, the themes of Micah, or Micah has several themes that we're going to go through, and what we'll see over the next seven weeks to close out the year is we have a couple of themes. Hey guys, let's keep it down over there. Um, we have judgment, we have hope. And then we have restoration. We have some prophecy in here. But the biggest thing we're going to see is that we have hard preaching, right? We, one, of the, one of the things that really distinguishes the, the Old Testament after you get through all the stories of the kings and everything is you start getting into the prophets. You know, you get through the poetic books and things like that. But once you get to like Isaiah, Jeremiah, you get to Ezekiel, you have a lot, obviously you have a lot of prophecy. But you also have a lot of hard preaching. And I think that's one of the things that distinguishes the Baptist, or at least an independent fundamental Baptist, from the rest of society is that we preach the entire Word of God. And a lot of the Word of God is negative. At least two-thirds of the Bible has very negative things to say about our condition. And I think it's important to realize that the reason the Bible is so negative is because we of our own accord are sinful. We're all sinners. It doesn't matter who, uh, how righteous one was, even Daniel. You, you, you think of guys like Daniel or Joseph or some of these guys that maybe Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so God's always had a remnant of not only good, good godly people, but he's also had a remnant of good godly people. Uh, preachers, obviously in the Old Testament we refer to them as prophets, but whether it was judges or kings, but mainly prophets, right? I mean, you, you, you see Samuel calling out Saul, you see Nathan calling out David, and you know, then you have Jeremiah and Isaiah, Hosea, and then, but one of the things that's, that stands out about Micah is that Micah follows that suit. And so sometimes we tend to maybe judge our ministries by the size of our church or by our reach or, you know, by our popularity. But the reality is God has people for all walks of life. Micah might not be mentioned a lot in the Bible. You know, he might not be Isaiah or Jeremiah, but you know what? He was important. And as I'm reading through the book of Micah, it's really interesting to see just what the word that God gave him. And what, you know, what, what's interesting is it sounds very similar to the word that he gave Hosea, and to the word he gave Isaiah, and to the word that he gave to even Oded. And these are prophets that were all in the same time that Micah was there. And of course, Isaiah has a very prominent role. He actually deals with the kings of the time, whereas Micah just brings a hard preaching of prophecy. But both of them are just as important. I mean, number one, because we see it in the Bible, but number two, because they're preaching God's word. Right? They're not afraid to say what's the truth. And let's go there to verse 1. We're going to spend a little bit of time. Today we're going to go through most of these verses fairly quickly. But verse 1, we're going to spend a little bit of time. This is going to be the majority of my sermon. And then we're going to go through the rest of all 16 verses. But there in, in Micah 1, the Bible says, The word of the Lord that came to Micah the Mora, uh, Morshathite in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. Now, what's Samaria? Samaria, after the split of Israel, is the is the north. Uh, I mean, the southern kingdom, and Samaria is the capital of what? Israel. And it's interesting. 
he doesn't even refer to it as Israel. He refers to it as, as Samaria. And you know why? Because God had set up Israel as one. So he no longer considers them worthy of that name because that name was when, who was the last king? Solomon, who was under the rule completely of Judah and Israel. But Samaria became that capital because Jerusalem was the original capital of Israel, but it remained the capital of what? Judah. And so we see here, he says, which he saw concerning both Samaria and Judah under what? Under the reign of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. All right? And so we go, uh, you guys can go with me, but go to 2 Kings 15. These are the three kings. I just want to give you a very brief history of the three kings. I think it's important uh, that we do that. And actually, I have just a lot of notes right here. Just so we know, we know we have Saul. I'm going to go through this fairly quickly, but I will review it as we go over the weeks because I might even do a board because I think it's important. But we have Saul, David, Solomon. And then when, when the kingdoms are split, you have Judah and Israel. And we're dealing with, it's interesting that he mentions the kings of Judah. The reason being is because Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah are basically ruling right towards the end of basically Israel before they're assimilated by what? Assyria, right? Both, both Judah and Israel end up going into captivity. We know that because if we read the book of Jeremiah, it makes that very clear. God actually warns them and says, hey, you need to go into captivity. That's the only way that you're going to get better. If you don't go into captivity, you're going to have some serious consequences. And we know one of the kings, Zedekiah, his, his eyes were taken off. I mean, after, well, first of all, he witnessed the death of his children and then he was, his eyes were removed and then he just died a horrible death because he refused to listen to the prophecy of Jeremiah that said, hey, you need to go into captivity. So we need to really listen to the word of God because we tend to think that only what we perceive to be good is good, but God sends good even when there's evil surrounding us, right? Well, let me not, let's not get uh, distracted, but just real quick, I'm going to focus today on just the, the, the kingdoms of Judah. When the kingdom divides, you have Rehoboam, Abijah, Asa, Jehoshaphat, Jehoram, Ahaziah, then you have a small reign from Athaliah, the queen, when she rebels, and you have Joash, Amaziah, Azariah, and then you get to jo Jotham, uh, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. And a couple of things that, that, to stand out, and we're going to look at those, but just as a quick recap, jo Jotham does good, but not all the way. So there's three categories that we see when we see these kings taking uh, rule. You have a king that does good in the eyes of the Lord, but doesn't remove all the high places. You have those kings that didn't do as their father David did. I mean, they're basically evil. Or you have a good king who, who followed the Lord greatly and was, uh, you know, did the things of the Lord, right? And so we see here in 2 Kings 15, verse 1, the Bible says, In the twenty and seventh year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, began Azariah, the son, I mean, son of Amaziah, king of Judah to reign. 16 years old was he when he began to reign and he reigned two and 50 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Jecoliah of Jerusalem. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah had done, save that the high places were not removed. The people sacrificed and burned incense still on the high places. And the Lord smote the king so that he was a leper unto the day of his death and dwelt in several house, in, in a several house. And I mean, we can just, uh, from the reading, remember when we were in school and I would say, what do you think this word means? From the reading, obviously, if he's a leper and he's in a several house, a several house from the reading is he's in a house that's separated from everybody else because lepers can't be within the camp, right? Obviously, he's a king, so they would have to set up accommodations for him. And Jotham, the king's son, was over the house, judging the people of the land. So he's already got, getting the practice. And the rest of the acts of Azariah and all that he did, and they did, and, and are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Judah? So Azariah slept with his fathers, and they buried him with his fathers in the city of David. And Jotham, his son, reigned in his stead. And we skip down to verse 30, just a couple of things to see about Jotham, and that's it. It says, And Hoshea, the son of Eli, Elah made a conspiracy against Pekah, 
the son of Remaliah, and smote him and slew him. So this is talking about the king of who? Israel. I know it's hard to keep up with all this, but just follow me. This is really important because it's good to learn all this stuff, right? It says, and slew him and reigned in his stead in the 20th year of Jotham, the son of Uzziah. Now Uzziah is Azariah. It's just a different name for him, right? And the rest of the acts of Pekah and all that he did, behold, they are written in the book of the Chronicles of the king of Israel. In the second year of Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, began Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, to reign. Five and twenty years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned sixteen years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Jerusa, and the daughter of Zadok. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. He did according to all that his father Uzziah had done. Howbeit the high places were not removed. The, see, the people sacrificed and burned incense still in the high places. He built the high, higher gate of the house of the Lord. Now the rest of the acts of Jotham and all that he did, are they not written in the book of Chronicles of the kings of Judah? In those days the Lord began to send Judah Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, and Jotham slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David, his father, and Ahaz, his son, reigned in his stead. So Micah is preaching during this time. And I want to just point out a couple of things because it's important to know why the Lord's doing what he's doing, right? It says there in 2 Chronicles, you don't have to turn there, I'll just read for you really quick. In 2 Chronicles 27, while I do that, go to 2 Chronicles 28, but I'll read for you really quick in 2 Chronicles 27. In verse 1, it says, of Jotham, it says, Jotham was 25 years old, 20 and 5 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Jerusha, the daughter of Zadok. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Uzziah did, howbeit he entered not into the temple of the Lord, and the people did yet corruptly. So we see a different word in here. What did he do? He's following the Lord, but you know where he's following him from? The live streaming. He's not going to church. And what the people do? They did yet corruptly. It says, he built the high gates of the house of the Lord on the wall of Ophel. He built much. And by the way, I mean, obviously, I'm using a metaphor. There's no live streaming back in the day, but he, he's not going to church is basically what it's saying. All right, and moreover, he built cities in the mountains of Judah, and in the forest he built castles and towers. He fought also with the king of the Ammonites and prevailed against them. And the children of Ammon gave him the same year a hundred talents of silver and ten thousand measures of wheat and ten thousand of barley. So much did the children of Ammon pay unto him, both the second year and the third. So Jotham became mighty because he prepared his way before the Lord as God. So why did Jotham... So it's not contradictory, right? The Lord blesses, he just doesn't bless all the way. See, when you're a child of God, you know, that doesn't mean that you're not getting the things. Of, it's like our children, right? Some children obey better than others, so they get better rewards, right? And so let's say I have two children, one obeys perfectly and the other one obeys sometimes. Well, when he obeys, I'm going to reward him, but when he misbehaves, I'm going to punish him, right? Whereas the other one just gets kind of more, more blessings because they, they disobey less. So the Lord is always true to his promises. And because Jotham prepared his ways before the Lord, Jotham became mighty, right? Because he prepared his ways before the Lord, Jotham became mighty. That doesn't mean that everything else he did was right. He did one thing right, and so the Lord blessed him because, it, like, like I said a couple weeks ago, God's rules apply to everybody some rules only apply to the spiritual in the sense that when the Lord says, if you do my, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments, then the only way to know that we love God is if we're keeping his commandments, right? But the Bible says if you work, then you eat. Well, that applies to everybody. That's why worldly people, even reprobates, anybody who's, if they work, they're going to eat. That rule can apply to anybody. That doesn't mean they're godly people. It just means that God has a rule that says, if you work, you'll eat. But that doesn't mean that you they can claim that they love God. Because the Bible says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Go to 2 Chronicles 28. We're there in verse 1. The Bible says, Ahaz was 20 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. 
but he did not that which was right in the sight of the Lord, like David his father, for he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel and made also molten images for Balaam. Moreover, he burned incense in the valley of Hinnom and burned his children in the fire after the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. He sacrificed also and burnt incense in the high places on the hills under every green tree. Wherefore the Lord his God delivered him into the hand of the king of Syria, and they smote him and carried him away a great multitude of them captives and brought them to Damascus. And he was also delivered into the hand of the king of Israel, who smote him with a great slaughter. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, let me, let me, let me. We are in Chron Second Chronicles 28, and you can go there. But now we've switched over to who? We're talking about King Ahaz after Jotham. I apologize for that. I have my notes here. I just didn't look. The reason I'm going through these is because these are the three kings that Micah is referring to. This is the time that he served, right? But what did Ahaz do? He didn't serve the Lord. Not only that, he burns molten images. Not only that, he makes his children go through the fire. And then he sacrificed and he burned incense, uh, I mean, incense in the high places. Wherefore, the Lord the God, he delivered him, verse 5 of uh, 2 Chronicles 28, into the hand of king of Syria. And they smote him and carried him a great multitude of the captives and brought them to Damascus. And he was also delivered into the hand of the king of Israel, who smote him with a great slaughter. For Pekah, the son of Remaliah, slew in Judah 120,000 in one day, which were all valiant men, because they had forsaken the Lord God of their fathers. And Zikri, a mighty man of Ephraim, slew Masai, the king's son, and Asricam, the governor of the house, and Elkanah, that was next to the king. And the children of Israel carried away captive of their brethren 200,000 women, sons, and daughters, and took away also away much spoil from them and brought the spoil to Samaria. So what happens? Ahaz takes over and he's a bad king. There's nothing good in him. I mean, and he's murdering children and he's putting up idols and he's worshiping the devil. And what does God do? He sends both Syria and Israel to attack him so much so that they lose 120,000 of the mighty, like men that are capable, it says. Where is it? Uh, which were all valiant men. So these weren't like uh, pansy soldiers, but the Lord didn't give them the victory. And then Israel takes captive or prisoner 200,000 women, sons, and daughters, and spoils. Go down to verse 16. It says, At that time did King Ahaz send unto the kings of Assyria to help him, for again the Edom Edomites had come and spent in Judah and carried away captives. The Philistines also had invaded the cities of the low country and of the south of Judah and had taken Beth, uh, Beth Shemesh and Ajalon and Gedaroth and Shoko and with the villages thereof and Timna with the villages thereof, Gizmo with also the villages thereof, and they dwelt there. For the Lord brought Judah low because of Ahaz, king of Israel, for he made Judah naked and transgressed sore against the Lord. What does that liken it to? Remember Adam and Eve? They, they eat of the fruit, and all of a sudden, they know they're naked. Right? They were not ashamed. They were uncovered in their sins. And it says, And Tilga, Tilgath Pilnazer, king of Assyria, came unto him and distressed him, but strengthened him not. For Ahaz took away a portion out of the house of the Lord and out of the house of the king and of the princes and gave it unto the king of Assyria, but he helped him not. And in the time of his distress, did he trespass yet more against the Lord? This is that King Ahaz, where he sacrificed unto the gods of Damascus, which smote him. And he said, because the gods of the kings of Assyria helped them, therefore will I sacrifice to them that I may help, that they may help me. But they were the ruin of him and of all of Israel. And Ahaz gathered together the vessels of the house of God and cut in pieces the vessels of the house of God, and shut up the doors of the house of the Lord. And he made him altars in every corner of Jerusalem, and in every several city of Judah. He made high places to burn incense unto other gods, and provoke to anger the Lord, of his the Lord God of his fathers. Now the rest of his acts, and all of his ways, first and last, behold, they are written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. And Ahaz slept with his fathers, and they buried him in the city, even in Jerusalem, 
but he brought him not into the sepulchers of the kings of Israel, and Hezekiah his son reigned in his stead. So the people didn't like him. They didn't even bury him with the kings. And what's one of the things we see about Ahaz? He doubles down. He's like, hey, I'm going to go get help from the world, and the world didn't help him. And he's like, well, it doesn't matter. I'm going to now cut everything into pieces. I'm just going to get more money, and the Lord didn't help him. Eventually, he ended up a bad king. He started out bad. He ended bad. Now go to 2 Kings 18. We're just going to cover very briefly, very, very briefly, Hezekiah. And the reason is because before I go into it, Hezekiah has a very long story. Hezekiah is a great king. Hezekiah has to fight against, San uh, remember, uh, the kings that are coming up against him. In that case, it's, uh, I always, it's hard to pronounce his name, but San Sankarib, you know, who's the, the messenger of the king at that time. And he, he comes to him. And I'm just going to give you the short story. He's like, hey, I'm not going to talk to you only, but to your people so I can frighten them. My king has taken out these people and their God, these people and their God. And I've preached on this. That's one of my favorite stories. And these people and their God and these people and their God. So what makes you think that we can't take you out and your God? Except that what? Hezekiah knows that God is the, the only God that lives. He's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And he comes to the Lord and he begs. And Isaiah says, hey, you'll be delivered. You're not even going to have to fight because they're going to get a rumor of war and they're going to leave. And then after that, Hezekiah is told that he has a certain, that he's basically dying. And he begs, you know, he prays solemnly and fervently. And the Lord hears his prayer and he says, hey, Isaiah, go back and tell him that he has 50 more years. And he says, what sign do you want? Do you want the sundial forward or the sundial back? And he says, well, the sundial forward, it's easy. Do it backwards. And the Lord does that. And so he, he stops time, basically. And then, because he's like now happy, some people from a land come and deceive him, saying they're coming from a far land. And he goes around his entire kingdom and he shows them everything. And Isaiah comes, he's like, what did you show him? He's like, everything. And he goes, because of that, because of your arrogance and your pride, basically, you're going to lose it all and your children are going to suffer. And this is that one famous thing where Hezekiah is like, well, whatever the Lord says, let it be. And people have criticized Hezekiah since I was a little kid listening to these stories because he kind of is indifferent to the fact that his children are going to suffer. But I will say one thing. He, he didn't lie. The Lord said, what will be, will be. And I mean, that's the truth, right? So we can't pick on him, but we're, we're there in 2 Kings 18, verse 1. That's why I said Hezekiah is like a whole other story because he's just got a lot going on. But it says, Now it came to pass in the third year of Hosea, son of Eli, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. Twenty and five years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned twenty and nine years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was also Abi, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father did. He removed the high places and break the images and cut down the groves and break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. For unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it, and he called it Neshutan. He trusted in the Lord God of Israel, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor any that were before him, for he clave to the Lord, and he departed not from following him. But he kept his commandments, which the Lord commanded Moses. And the Lord was with him, and he prospered whithersoever he went forth. And he rebelled against the king of Assyria, and served him not. He smote the Philistines unto Gaza, and the borders thereof, from the tower of the watchmen to the fenced city. So we see he starts out great, and then there's all the other story I just told you about. What's interesting here is if we were to read Josiah, it has a very similar saying about you know, there's not going to be a king before or after him like him. And the reason I didn't want to go into it is because obviously we'd have to break into detail what's said about these guys. But the one thing that's true about both of them, Hezekiah and Josiah, is they followed after the Lord. Right? It says, he trusted in the Lord God of Israel, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor any that were before him. For he clave to the Lord and departed not from following him but kept his commandments, which the Lord commanded Moses. What did he do? He clave. He held on to the Lord. He's like, whatever you need me to do, Lord, like I'm going to follow you to the ends of the earth. 
Unfortunately, Ahaz didn't do such a good job, and Jotham was kind of half-half. And we've got all the stuff going on in Israel with Pekah and you know all, all the other kings, uh, Pekaniah and Hosea. Like these guys are just, you know, it's a whole other thing. And so these are the kings. This is the time when Micah is writing this. And I think it's important because if we're going to go through all seven chapters over the next seven weeks to understand why Micah is saying what he's saying, this is what he's been dealing with. Jotham served the Lord, but he didn't go all the way. Ahaz, I mean, not only did he rebel, like he, he, uh, what he, he dug in. He was like, I'm going to be worse. And Hezekiah comes back and he does a really good job, but at the end he kind of messes up, right? He, he gets that judgment from uh, the Lord because he, from the prophet Isaiah, because he showed all this stuff. And the, the thing that we see is Micah's going to make some harsh judgments, but he's also going to give some stuff, and he's basing it based on this information. Now, here's the other thing that I want to point out, and then we'll go through all the verses, verse by verse, but there's other men of God. You don't have to turn there. Stay there in second, or, or go back to Second Chronicles 28. But in Isaiah 1, verse 1, it says, The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. So he, he obviously is dealing with other than before he was dealing with Uzziah, which Micah's not mentioning Uzziah, right? But, but it all carries through. In Hosea 1.1, we see, it says, The word of the Lord that came to Hosea, the son of Beeri, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. So it's, it's likely that Hosea and Isaiah and Micah and some other prophets, they knew each other. They're getting, they're getting together, but they're like, some serious stuff's going down. And you know how I know? Because if you read through Hosea, and you read through Isaiah, and you read through Micah, you're going to see very similar language, very similar judgments, very similar uh, outcomes. In 2 Chronicles 28, in verse 9, which we skip, but I'm going to go through it right now. We see it says, but a prophet of the Lord was there whose name was Oded. So we also have Oded, who doesn't even have a book, but we know he's the prophet of the Lord. And he went out before the host that came to Samaria and said unto him, Behold, because the Lord God of your fathers was wroth with Judah, he hath delivered them into your hand, and ye have slain them in a rage that reacheth up to heaven. So this is after they Pekaliah, uh, you know, uh, Pekai, uh, Pika, sorry, takes them captive, and he beats 120,000 and takes over 200,000. Oded comes, and he's like, hey, you got the victory, but then you went too far. It says, And now ye purpose to keep under the children of Judah and Jerusalem for bondmen and bondwomen unto you, but they're not with you, even with you, since against the Lord your God. Now hear me, therefore, and deliver the captives again, which ye have taken captive of your brethren, for the fierce wrath of the Lord is upon you. Hey, when the Lord gives you a victory, don't gloat, is basically what's going on. Don't overdo it. In sales, we call that talking yourself out of a sale, right? Remember you learned that? When, you, when they say yes, shut up. When the Lord says you've won, you've won. Don't get that American attitude where winning is everything. It doesn't matter who we trample over, who we push at the side, who we do things. I mean, God's angry. Not only says he's angry at them, he says that the wrath of, the, of God is upon them. He says, the certain of the heads of the children of Ephraim, then certain of the children of the heads of the children of Ephraim, Azariah, the son of Johanan, Berechiah, the son of Meshelamoth, and Jehezekiah, the son of Shalom, and Amasa, the son of Haldai, uh, Hatlai, stood up against them that came from the war and said unto them, Ye shall not bring the captives hither. For whereas we have offended against the Lord already, ye intend to add more to our sins and to our trespass. For our trespass is great, and there's fierce wrath against Israel. So the armed men left the captives and the spoil before the princes and all the congregation. And the men which were expressed by name rose up and took the captives with the spoil, clothed all that were naked among them, and arrayed them, and shot them, and gave them to eat and to drink, and anointed them, and carried all the feeble upon the asses, and brought them to Jericho, the city of palm trees, 
to their brethren that they returned to Samaria. So we see the men of God are important. Israel, as Pekah, they're not doing a great job. But somehow, and we're not going to go through that story, the Lord gives them the victory over Judah. But instead of just ending it there, they take it too far. It says that they ravaged, right? It says, I mean, uh, and you slay them in a rage that reacheth up to heaven. Not in a ravage. I mean, well, basically, they're, they're enraged against their own brothers and sisters in Christ. Look, we're going to have fights with other brothers and sisters in Christ. That's just, just life. But once it's done, it's done. In other words, don't let it blind you, right? And he says, but think about it. Oded is mentioned only in this, in this section of Bible. He's, he doesn't have a book. He doesn't have anything. But he's obviously someone to be uh, not trifled with. You know why? Because he preaches hard. He called them out. And they know he's true so much so that some of the leaders ignore the king and they take it upon themselves to return the captives, feed them, clothe them, return their spoil, help the feeble. I mean, that is the power of God. When you get up and you preach, it doesn't matter if you're preaching to 5, 10 people or 100 people. As long as you're preaching the word of God, somebody's going to respond. See, it's not my duty to get Donald Trump or anybody else to listen to me. It's my duty to get the people of God to listen to him. I don't have to do what the government tells me to do. I need to do what God tells me to do. And so if it's our duty to go out and help our brothers and sisters in Christ, then it's our duty to help our brothers and sisters in Christ. But the reason I'm pointing this out is because these men of God are mentioned in the Bible because they're preaching hard. Because if we read through the book of Jeremiah, which I actually I meant to bring up because Micah actually is mentioned in Jeremiah, but we'll touch on that later. Jeremiah, he's re referenced, you know, they don't kill him because they're like, he's like Jeremiah. I mean, he's like Micah, but that's a whole other conversation. But as we read through it, what was one of the main things that Jeremiah was dealing with? He's like, look, if these guys are preaching to you in the name of God and it does not come true, Guess what? They're not. They're not sent from God. Because just like today, you have two sides of the coin. You have those preaching the truth and those trying to, to convince you that, you know, that they are preaching the truth. And they're not. Right? My wife was, was paying attention um, to one of these other pastors, you know, all this things and she read something where I guess somebody you know one of these churches had given money to like these victims because they wanted to absolve their church from supposedly the sins of this other pastor I've already touched on it a lot but what I want to touch on is the fact that that's work salvation you can't like I can't take the tithe of our church Let's just assume that Pastor Cobb and myself were really bad and oppressive church members and somehow we damaged somebody and then some new pastor comes in here and he's like, well, I'm going to take the tithes and give them to those victims that Pastor Cobb and Pastor Ray has hurt so that we can absolve that church of their sins. You know what? It may sound like someone that's preaching godly things, but we scrutinize it based on the word of God and we're like, wait, that doesn't add up. So that thing... It's not from God. I'm not saying that man is not a man of God. I'm just saying maybe he's not following God right now. Maybe he's a little backslidden, and a little wicked, trying to do things that sound like work salvation and confusing the people when you're supposed to be saying it's by faith alone. You know who absolves the sins of the oppressed? Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. It's not my duty to go around righting every wrong. It's God's duty. My duty is to preach the word of God, right? I mean, either we listen to God or we don't. Do I wish I could absolve every, fix every wrong? I mean, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's what every hero movie is based on. But we're not God. My duty is to focus on my community here in the Spring Branch area, 
and preach the word of God. And when I go out into the mission field, preach the word of God. When I go with my friends and family, preach the word of God. And sometimes that includes the gospel message. Sometimes that includes just hard truths. Now, most of the time, I don't have to do that in person because we have preaching from behind the pulpit where I can do that. But let's go, let's, let's continue. That's like I said, this is the majority. We're going to go through this fairly quickly. But go back to Micah 1. We're going to go through these verses fairly quickly because it's, it's a very easy theme to follow. We see this throughout the Bible. And in verse 2 of Micah, it says, Hear all ye people, hearken, O earth, oh, and all that therein is, and let the Lord God be witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. Now, here's a great thing. You know, I used to get discouraged when I first started preaching, and we had a smaller congregation. You know, the Lord's blessed recently. We've, we, we've grown, and I'm really appreciative, but we know that God gives the increase. No increase in our church has anything to do with Pastor Cobb, or myself, or even you guys. You know who gives it? God. We just got to show up and do the work of the Lord. But I like what Micah says here. He says, hear all ye people. Hearken, O earth. You know why? Because Micah knows that God's word doesn't return void. It's not our duty to look at who we're preaching. It's our duty to preach. I think it actually has a supernatural effect. Because remember, there's a veil that doesn't give us access to that spiritual world. But when I preach God's word from this pulpit, the demons, you know, the uh, and the devil and his minions, they get word of it spiritually. Now, I'm not trying to be hokey. I'm not. It's just the truth, right? God knows where his people are working. And I'm not even actually exaggerating. I'm not being hokey because why would Micah say something like that if it wasn't true? He says, hear all ye people, hearken, O earth. All that are there, and all that there is, all that therein is, and let the Lord God be witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. For behold, the Lord cometh forth out of his place, and will come down and tread upon the high places of the earth, and the mountain shall be molten under him. Why? Because he's a consuming fire, and the valley shall be cleft, because his words are like thunder, as wax before the fire, and as the waters that are poured down a steep place. For the transgression of Jacob is all this, and for the sins of the house of Israel. And then I love this because you're like, oh, what is the transgression of Jacob? But he answers it here. That's why I didn't have to go too deep because it says, what is the transgression of Jacob? And then he says, rhetorically, is it not Samaria? And what are the high places of Judah? Are they not Jerusalem? So what is the transgression of Jacob? Israel and Judah. And Samaria, you know why? Because if you look at the kings, they're just letting people do whatever the heck they want. It says there in verse 6, Therefore I will make Samaria as an heap of the field and as a plantings of the vineyard, and I will pour down the stones thereof into the valley, and I will discover the foundations thereof. Basically, he's going to wipe out Samaria. So much so that you're going to have a foundation. He's, he's cleaning the house. You know, this, this building is a little bit old. And maybe one of the days we might have to topple this, right, in order to build a new one. That's literally what the Lord's saying. He's like, we're going to start with a clean slate. He says in verse 7, All the graven images thereof shall be beaten to pieces, and all the hires thereof shall be burned with the fire, and all the idols thereof will I, day des will I lay desolate, for she gathered it to the of the hire of an harlot, and they shall return to the hire of and harlot. In other words, they were whoring around spiritually and physically. It says, therefore, I will wail and howl. I will go strip, stripped and naked. I will make a wailing like the dragons and the morning as owls. I mean, literally, Micah's like, you're going to hear my pangs. It says, for her wound is incurable, for it has come unto Judah he has come unto the gate of my people, even to Jerusalem. Declare, and then he goes into, and he starts calling out cities in that region. He says, declare ye, not, ye it not at Gath, weep ye not at all in the house of Ephra. Roll thyself in the dust. Pass ye away, thou inhabitant of Sapphire, having thy, na thy shame naked, the inhabitant of Zanon. Come not forth in the morning 
of Beth, Beth, uh, Bethesel. He shall receive of you his standing. For the inhabitant of Maroth waited carefully for good, but evil came down from the Lord unto the gate of Jerusalem. O thou inhabitant of Lachish, bind the chariot to the swift beast. She is the beginning of the sin of the daughter of Zion. Who's the daughter of Zion? You know, Jerusalem. For the transgression of Israel, or Israel, right? It's referred to, but Israel as a whole. We get the, the, the definition here. Wherefore, foul, uh, for the transgression of Israel were found in thee. So, I mean, he's going around, he's calling everybody out. And I get this all the time. You shouldn't call people out from the pulpit. Well, then I guess I shouldn't read my Bible. Because Micah was given a word by the Lord, and he said, Hear all ye inhabitants, oh, and the entire earth. And if it wasn't enough, let me just remind you, all these cities. You know why? Because hard preaching is not general, it's specific. Verse 14, Therefore shall thou give presents to Moresheth Gath, the house of Axib, shall be a lie to the kings of Israel. Yet will I bring an heir unto thee, O inhabitant of Moresha. He shall come unto Adullam, the glory of Israel. And right here, I think this is prophetic from my point of view, just from reading in the little study that I did. Obviously, we know that Jesus is coming, and Micah does give prophecy of the coming Lord. But also, Adullam is the cave where David took refuge when he was being chased. And this is likened to the, uh, come to Adullam, the glory of Israel, right? To the safety place. It says, make thee bald and pull thee. And right there, that word pull just means cut, cut your hair or to, to chop off. It says, make thee bald and pull thee for thy delicate children. Enlarge thy baldness as an eagle for they are gone into captivity from thee. So we see a harsh judgment. He does give them hope. But he says, you need to do these things. What is it? He, when he's saying, hey, cut your hair off, do these things, it says, humble yourselves, right? In the Old Testament, they used to do that, right? They used to put on ash cloth and, and, and strip naked and put on sackcloth and ashes, sometimes shave their head. Um, maybe I said ash cloth, but it's ashes and sackcloth. Like it's, it's, a, it's a contrast to what the world's teaching today, right? I mean, honestly... This is it right here. It's easy. Micah starts out by calling out judgment. And the reason he's doing that is because probably in those cities, because, you know, I looked this up and I, I try to be as thorough, but these cities are only mentioned in this, in these chapters, most of these. Of course, you have Lachish and some of these more uh, popular ones, but these other cities, they're mentioned probably because Micah's given word because of all the stuff that's going on. Because remember, it's not just... These are the kings that are mentioned, but he's not just dealing. These are the prophets of both Israel and Judah. They're going around preaching the word. They're on tour. Right? So you still have the kings of Israel, Pekah, and, and I have them here, uh, Pekahiah, Hosea. Like, these guys are not good guys. And independent of all that, the people are still doing whatever they want. I mean, we saw that with Jotham. It says, he wouldn't go to church, and that's why they, they dealt corruptly. You know, because you want to you clean up your life, you got to go to church. That's why Baptists are three to thrive. Because you know what? If I don't have church three times a week, the world will take over. Micah's calling people out for not doing the things of the Lord. They're not reading their Bibles. They're not hearkening to the Lord. They're not humbling themselves. And God said, you know what? I'm done. There's judgment coming. And as Christians, we need to realize there's judgment coming. Judgment's already here. The thing is, since I'm not God, I don't know how much judgment he's poured out already. I mean, obviously some stuff's evident, but I don't know how much more is coming. Specifics. Obviously, we know the end of the world is coming. We know that, that the beast is coming. We have those specifics. But before all that, I just don't know how it's all going to play out. But there's some serious consequences. And as Christians, we need to keep our eye on the ball. Micah said, hey, listen up. 
You know, if I was Micah and we're translating this today, I'd be like, hey, Spring Branch and Pearland and Woodlands and Conroe and Katy, right? And Magnolia. That's what he's doing. He's calling those cities out. He says, you guys, you guys are all jacked. Spring Branch, all 11 council districts, city of Houston, Harris County. That's what he's going around doing. And you know what? I can say that because for the most part, even though Texas voted red, there is a lot of wickedness in the city of Houston. Literally one of the largest Planned Parenthoods in the entire nation is right there off of 45 on your way to Hobby Airport. Every time I pass by there, it just disgusts me. It makes me, I, I probably make a face. They just murder and murder and murder and murder and murder. And they think, we're going to be fine. We're America. I think it's so funny, I'll close with that, that Trump wins and everybody's like, oh, you know, my, uh, I was watching this one video. This one girl was like, uh, what did she say? She said, oh, I'm going to go get my tubes tied before I can't get my tubes tied anymore. People have been tying their tubes since, like, they were able to tie tubes. It's disgusting and wicked, and you shouldn't do it unless there's, like, a, obviously, there's always exceptions to the rule. But for the most part, if you're healthy and you're fertile, just let the Lord do what he needs to do. But, you know, people are acting like all of a sudden they're going to, they're not going to, Trump is for money. Let me, let me clear some stuff up for these right-wing Republicans. Trump is for money. He will never close down Planned Parenthood in Houston, Texas, even if he bans abortion, because you need to have all that money funneling through Planned Parenthood. Simple as that. All these people are like, why well, am I going to be able to kill my babies? It's sad that in America we would say, you're an idiot, because you know what? We're so wicked as a nation that we'll help you kill your baby by just transferring you to another state. It's gross, right? That we would have a country where even as a Christian, as a Baptist Christian, I can say, I don't even know why these guys are idiots because you can go do it anywhere. It's sad that you can have that easy of an access to murdering babies, right? Or to changing the genders or to messing people up psychologically. Because at the end of the day, the reason we're not going to stop any of that in America is because money rules and morality drools, right? Remember as a kid, boys rule, girls, girls drool, or, you know, the girls would say boys, girls rule, boys drool. I know I might be facetious, but that's what it is. The problem with America is they didn't read Micah. They started in Genesis. They got through Genesis 15, and they got they got to the genealogy. I mean, I'm, maybe I'm getting too far. They made it. They didn't even maybe maybe they didn't even get that far. You know why I think they didn't get that far? Because it's not until Genesis 19 where you have Sodom and Gomorrah, and apparently everybody's like really offended when you say that queers should die. Most people read Genesis 1 on January 1st, maybe Genesis 2, maybe Genesis 3, and then they quit. And then the next month they're like, I want to start all over again. So they'll start in Matthew. They'll read Matthew 1 and Matthew 2, and then they quit. So they never get to Micah. I mean, I'm just going to be honest with you. I'm, I'm kind of enjoying the study because I've read my Bible through and through, but you know, it's just... They're in the middle, so you don't read them as much as you do Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. So it's fun to read stuff that you just don't get to often and just get reminded that God's tough. He preaches hard and he says, hey, in the time of these kings, Micah, even in danger, because they killed the prophets, the Bible tells us in, in, in the Gospels, you're going to preach hard. And guess what? There was still a remnant that was willing to preach hard and preach the word of God. So in conclusion, what are the three themes we're going to see over the next couple of weeks? We're going to see judgment. We've already seen some of it. We're going to see hope or really, I think, prophecy and restoration. But it starts out pretty rough. He calls everybody out. Judah thinks they're better than Israel. Israel thinks they're better than Judah. And God says, 
None of you. Which reminds us why the New Testament is the better testament, because the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But then John 3.16 tells us, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It's not because Israel was great. It's not because Judah was great. It's not because America was great. It's because God is great. That's why it's so important to read Micah and all the prophets and all the things that God has set out, set forth for us. Because like I said on Sunday, it's not enough to be saved to live on this earth and get blessings. You will go to heaven simply by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. But that does not necessarily entitle you to all the blessings that the Bible has promised if you don't do the things that God has asked you on this earth. The only thing you're entitled to with salvation by grace through faith is exactly that. Salvation by grace through faith. You're not entitled to wonderful children or great wife or a wonderful job or, you know, always food on. you got to work for those things. 